Hello viewers, Richard here. So over the past couple of days I've been learning this little fugue in G minor by J.S. Bach. It's, I think, arguably one of his most popular pieces, but I've always put off learning it because I've always been a bit scared of it. Anyway, this week I've finally uh, taken a bite of that bullet and got it learnt. So I thought it would be a good chance for us to have a look at the uh, articulation, a couple of ideas for registration, um, have a look at some of those trills. This is me performing this piece, which you'll see in its entirety at the end of the video. And you'll also, before we get there, see me going through the trials and tribulations of learning something for the very first time. So you join me after about five, six hours of me practicing this piece. I thought I'd spare you the gruesome detail of me um, starting this piece from scratch because there are more interesting things to do. For example, watching your grass turn green again, or to use a well-known phrase to watch paint dry. Like all good stories, I like to start at the end. Uh, well, not many stories start at the end, but some of them do. I like to start at the end when learning a piece, simply because it allows me to then play the previous section and lead into the section that I've just played previously. And this is what I'm doing now. I'm starting at the very back of the grid and uh, working my way forwards all the way through to uh, pole position uh, at the minute I'm in about P15. And I find that doing this uh, method uh, gives you a sense of continuity and how the music flows in that forward direction. You're not always stopping and starting. This is a trick that I learnt during my organ scholar days I honestly never look back it's just so so it's revolutionary frankly you know occasionally we come across things in life which really revolutionize the way we do things and also the, the trills there did you notice that the that held f should have been actually a trill on the f and the g i don't i'm not playing them because i'm trying to get a sense of a continuity i'm trying to keep the tempo going the music going i'm trying to get used to the geography just to, just just to the way the music feels and to the way the phrases are made up and the way it's progressing forwards i know this might sound completely backwards to what you've always learned but i don't worry too much about wrong notes so early on in the practice process let me explain what i mean by that with familiarity of learning a piece of music um you actually get used to playing the notes correctly the danger, of course, occurs when you end up making the same mistakes over and over again because that's when you become ingrained with those mistakes and they get embedded into your muscle memory. And at that point, it becomes really hard to eradicate. But if it's just a slip here and there, which you're making for the first time, it's almost certainly going to be um, a lack of concentration, which if you end up going over the bar that you just made a mistake on, you're going to become more fatigued, make more mistakes, and your concentration is going to suffer as a result. For some reason, in this section, my left hand had just kept bottling it. I just couldn't get the coordination between the left and the right, and I don't think pulling that music desk forward is going to help at all. What you need to do when you're uh, stuck like this is just slow the music right down, because no matter how fast you play something, you are still playing, if you play it correctly, I mean, you are still playing the notes in the correct order which is always really good for muscle memory and for coordination. And then over the course of a few minutes, you can then just speed the tempo up gradually. This is a moment where I had to work out some fingering. Uh, the left hand just doesn't want to play ball at all, let alone bark. Uh, going up towards that trill um, actually feels very unnatural somehow, uncomfortable. So as you can see, I, I gave it another run there, but. It, still wasn't any better. Um, sometimes I find that if you just do it again and try not to think about it too much, your hand will just naturally do some uh, logical fingering and then you can make a note of it. But I found here, it just I couldn't work it out naturally, so I had to really think about it. So I'm going to put the finger uh, three over on the F, which then leaves fingers two and one in a beautiful position to trill away on the G and the A. Let's take a run at it and see if I can do it. Oh, get in there, son. Get in. He's done it. All right, all right. Don't celebrate too soon. You've got to sort out those trills in a minute. Well, the good news is there are only two kinds of trills in this piece. There's the short one on the uh, dotted quaver. 
and I'm just playing them here to work out how many uh, sort of turns there should be. And I should always start on the the upper notes for this twill, trill. Sorry. Now these next trills on the long note really caused me grief. So what I'm doing here is just playing the trill uh, as uh, simple semiquavers to match the left hand, so I actually can get used to moving the fingers on the right hand at the same time as the left hand. It sounds really obvious, but it just it sort of unlocks that coordination um, lock, if you like, in your brain, which says your right hand has to move as well as your left hand. So if you just do it in tempo, it, it somehow unlocks that ability to do it. He says, well, there doesn't really seem to be unlocking much at the minute. I take another shot at it here, and I actually take a, quite a few more shots uh, before I hit anywhere near the bullseye. Um, just, it took a long time for this to feel natural, and I must say, these sections, these uh, where the, your pedal is playing the um, part of the subject, your left hand is doing different sort of uh, directional notes to the pedal, and your right hand is doing a trill. These are the sections which really put me off this piece as a young student. I just couldn't do it. And I think this is why I've got the, the heebie-jeebies uh, about it at the minute. But perseverance does pay off in the end, I promise. There was a chap once, could have been a woman, one or the other, who said, variety is the spice of life. And we all know that he was definitely talking about the organ works of J.S. Spark, rather than cinnamon. Uh, so I'm going to add some mordants here to um, make it my own individual interpretation. And then towards the end of the piece, I'm going to add a little cheeky trill just before the very final pedal entry. It's a fairly obvious one, really, because it's just a leading back into the tonic key. But I can expect people to unsubscribe in their thousands if I don't give them the cheeky trills in the obvious places. But I bet you won't be seeing this one coming. This very cheeky little dance we have at the end. Check that out. You won't see that anywhere else. Incredible scenes here at BIS. Individuality, what was it? Variety is a spice of what now? So we're now going to move into the aspect of playing Bark, which is by far the hardest and probably the most daunting as well. This is the articulation of playing Bark. This is like just the, the, the area where there is so much um, study and scholarly research and divisive opinion and there are some people who are adamant that Bach should be played in a very certain way. And if it isn't played in that certain way, it's just wrong. And frankly, I say to those people, no, you're wrong, I'm afraid. Bach should always be about interpretation, about individuality. And there is, there is no right or wrong way of playing Bach. There just isn't. According to Peter Phillips, the great academic of J.S. Bach, this particular piece belongs to the North German school of, are you ready for this? Spielteamen. Which according to Google means game themes. I don't know whether Peter Phillips had that in mind when he was uh, writing his book. So basically this bit, it means idiomatic uh, or fun to play, which this piece is definitely uh, fun to play. It's, it is little, it's 68 bars long as we mentioned before, but there is a lot of opportunity to uh, introduce some of your individuality in it. You've got the subject here, which by itself you can do so much with it, just because of the, the grouping of the notes leads itself to very uh, differing interpretations as I'm, just, as I'm doing in the background now. So I'm adding some tenuto markings on some of these, um, these strong notes. I'm not adding slurs as such, I'm using tenutos just so I know where I'm taking the phrase. And of course, the bad news is for us all, no matter what we decide uh, with the articulation for the opening subject, we then need to replicate that through the whole piece with the answers and the subjects that keep reappearing. You'll have to let me know in the comments, uh, do I do that later on in the performance? Just take a quick listen to the articulation of this episode. Yep, you heard it here. Richard McVeigh toyed with the idea of playing Bach entirely legato. I actually decided against it in the end, even though I was trying to convince myself that I should do it, just to see what the comments would be. So I'm actually going to detach the first note. 
um, which then acts as a springboard up to the top note, but then keep the descending notes fairly, fairly detached, not overly detached, not staccato, but not detached either, somewhere in between. Sort of a nice uh, unlegato legato, if you know what I mean. There are a couple of things going on here. I've just discovered another place for a potential cheeky trill. I'm not entirely sure yet about that one. You'll have to see whether that one makes a cut in the final performance later on. But immediately after that cheeky trill, there is um, a sequence of really beautiful chords. And I'm just wanting to tease out some tenuto just leading up to that C minor chord. But I'm actually just pondering Pondering is a good word, isn't it? I ponder as I wander over yonder as I blunder. <laughs> anyway, I digress. I'm wondering whether I should start letting you two on the third beat or the fourth beat of that bar. Let's now get down to the good stuff and talk about registration. So this is what I've been using so far. Eight and four flutes, essentially, across the two divisions on this wonderfully clear organ of Nitra. It's perfect for practicing. Uh, available from Piotr Grobowski. And there are two types of registration which people use for this piece. There's an 8, 4 and 2 like this. Or there's a planum sound where you bring together the principal chorus up to the mixture across the divisions if appropriate and a pedal read like this. Being totally inspired there by Doreen and Jonathan's wonderful performances on YouTube, I decided to fire up the Muller organ in the St. Bovo Kirk in Harlem. This world famous organ is actually housed in an insanely generous acoustic and will require a bit of thought with regards to tempo and again that art uh, articulation. But do you know what? This organ will play literally anything. So let's see which one of those two registrations we prefer on this beast of an organ. Yeah, like an absolute idiot. I dropped my fork in between the pedal board whilst waiting for Harlem to load. I suppose that will teach me for having my lunch at uh, my office desk. And eventually Harlem is loaded. All of our grass has now definitely turned green and the paint on the wall has most certainly dried. The problem is I've actually got a new uh, external hard drive, 18 terabytes actually. And all of the organs are stored on there, which is why it takes longer to load. But once they're loaded, it actually works okay. I'm actually going for the, the big planum sound first. It'd be rude to not to start big, wouldn't it? Let's have a listen. And after all that tarting around in that generous acoustic, this is a registration that I finally choose. You can pause it on the screen if you like. This now brings a performance. I'm just getting the metronome marking there. 72, so I get the tempo right. Listen out for everything we've spoken about in this video. Leave me a comment. Enjoy.
Thanks for watching, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that video. Um, I'll assume you did because you're still here. If you're new around here, um, get yourself subscribed. Leave me a comment. I do read all the comments and I really do appreciate them. Click the like button. Have an amazing day. If you don't, I want to know why. Until next time, I'll say cheerio. Goodbye.